ಸುಬಾಲು ಅಂತ ಅನ್ನೋದಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಅದ ದ ಮಾನಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸಮ್ ಕಿರಿಬ ಫಾರ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಇಯರ್ ವಿ ಗೆಟ್ ದಿ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಟು ಸರ್ವ್ ಯು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ವಿ ರಿಯಲಿ ಚೆರಿಷ್ ಆನಸ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಬಾಟಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ just to be able to show you in whatever simple way the love and compassion we have for all and i also recognize a few faces who were there for the oil anointing ceremony at the monastery so it's always good to see whenever you can make it i know it's not always easy or convenient and practical living on this side and then you have to get there it's not a short easy journey but whenever you can of course you're always welcome i don't need you to i don't need to keep reminding you that do i you can always consider that to be a home away from home from some, time to time people come and spend a short short break maybe a couple of days two to three days in the future we will actually have better accommodation there so when you come you can you can stay within a short distance from the monastery because right now perhaps when you come you'll have to look for accommodation <coughs> and that's not always easy because people are moving closer to the monastery and uh making it their dwelling in the vicinity of the monastery so sometimes it may not be easy to find places to stay but that will all change little by little nothing is ever easy is it <laughs> especially if you are trying to do something good it's never easy but then that's why we are here if it all was so easy if it was all so easy then they wouldn't they wouldn't need people like you and i to do it we are resolved we are determined to do good as much as we possibly can to the world while we are still here so day by day little by little i think when we get together there's nothing we can we cannot accomplish that is the power of unity that is the power of togetherness not necessarily physically being together because we are hardly like that but we are together in our purpose when two people want the same thing although they may be in two different places they're all looking in the same direction and then they start pulling together in the same direction and then they make a wish they make a resolve they determine and then they start taking action and eventually great things begin to happen so even at the monastery as a swami nuhanse as a monk i'm always alone but i'm always together it's funny how these two things can be true at the same time i'm alone in the sense that i'm alone in the sense that i am not attached to anything or at least that's where i'm getting myself to but i'm always together in the sense that i'm always together in the purpose in a shared purpose i'm always with you don't you see that i'm not only with you on sunday mornings i'm always with you because i'm always thinking about nibbana remember it's not my nibbana or your nibbana it's always nibbana nibbana is nibbana is nibbana is nibbana so nibbana is the same for everyone and so therefore i'm always with you but I'm only with you on Sunday mornings. After that, I'm alone. You don't invite me around even, do you? After all these sermons, you don't even invite me for a dhani. And don't. <laughs> Because I like to be by myself. But I also like to be with you. These two things I see can only be true at the same time in the Sambhuddha Sasana. being alone and being together ladies and gentlemen i need you to learn to love yourselves better honestly you really have to learn to love yourself better than you do right now i learned how to love myself i used to love the things i wanted that's what i used to be i used to love the things i wanted i used to love the people i wanted to be with and the things i wanted to be with but i didn't love myself because if i did i wouldn't go attaching myself to things would i 
What happens when you attach to something? When you attach yourself to something, what happens? What happens? You suffer. When do you suffer? When you have it or when you don't have it? Think carefully and answer, because you know I ask you some tricky questions from time to time. And you're, I always checkmate you. You know that, right? I'm mean like that. Do you suffer when you have what you want or when you don't have what you want? When do you suffer? A, when you have. B, when you don't have. C, both. Ah, well, there you go then. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So you're damned either way. If you're attached, you suffer. So anyone who loves themselves, they don't attach themselves to things. That's the trick. That's the secret. That's the secret I'm here to share with you. How do you, know, how do you live your life in a way that you don't attach yourself to the things that you're around? It's not about possession. It's not about having things around you. It's about mentally attaching yourself to things. That's where suffering begins. And where you can sever those bonds, mental bonds, not the physical bonds. Where you can learn how to detach yourself from anything and everything. That is where your liberation begins. And if you're liberated, then that is a man who loves himself. I need all of you to learn to love yourselves better. And if you learn to love yourselves better, you can learn to love another man, another woman, another child, in a very selfless way. If you say that you love anyone else in this room or anyone else in this world, if you haven't learned the art of loving yourself properly yet, then that love that you have is tainted by defilements. That love is not pure love. That's why I can put my hand up and say, I love you purely, without any expectations. I don't expect anything from you, at all. The Mahasanga is like that. They don't expect anything from you. But your love for another man, woman, will usually have an expectation. And therefore, that love is not pure love. And the only reason for that is because you are yet to learn how to love yourself. So that's what we're here to learn. How does one learn, how does one love oneself properly? In a way that they teach themselves not to attach, because attachment only ever brought you suffering. It didn't bring you anything else other than suffering. Don't just take my word for it, because that's what the Dhamma is here for. It's not my word that you need. What the Dhamma does is it makes it your word. You're able to internalize the Dhamma and then it becomes your conviction. You know the difference between bhakti and shraddha? Bhakti is a faith. You just believe it just because someone says so, someone senior, someone in power, someone in authority, someone who looks like he knows what he's talking about. Do I look like what I, I know what I'm talking about? That's bhakti. But bhakti is not what we need. Although we do bhakti gita for Vesak and Posonga and so on, that's not what we need. We need shraddha. Shraddha is where your journey on the, in the Buddha sasana begins. You go from bhakti to shraddha to ashraddha. And arahant is someone who, is, who has ashraddha. Meaning they have completed whatever they have to do through shraddha. And they have come to complete conviction. In other words, their journey is complete. They no longer need to take something simply by conviction. Because they have completely internalized the truth. And they have... You know, it's a bit like trusting the ferry that you're on will get you across the, across, the, across the stream. Right? It's about trusting. If you are on the show and you see a ferry, now you have faith. You, you have faith that the ferry might get you across. Next, you get onto the ferry. Right? And you owe yourself a little bit into the stream. And now you have a bit of confidence. You feel, ah, okay, I'm still steady. Right? It looks like I'll be okay. It looks like I'll be okay. Because how can you say that now? You're now on the ferry. But there's, there are still people on the show. They're looking at you. They're looking at you, checking whether you're going to fall into the water. So they still have faith, but they don't have confidence. But once you're in the, on the ferry and you're crossing the stream, now you have confidence or other conviction. Now what about once you get across the stream? 
Now what do you have to say about the ferry? Well, now you no longer need the ferry. So, you have nothing to say about the ferry. That's what I mean by ashraddha. The Dhamma is merely a ferry to get you across the ocean of sansara. After you've gotten yourself across, you don't need the Dhamma, honestly. You don't need the Dhamma once you've got your, gotten yourself across the ocean of sansara or the stream of sansara. So for one who has entered the stream, we call them a stream enterer, they have conviction, they have confidence in the Dhamma. Confidence that the Dhamma that they practice is beginning to make a transformation within them and that it will get them across the stream onto the other side. But once you have completed your journey and have become an Arahant, now you no longer have any use for the ferry whatsoever because the ferry's job is done. If you learn to love yourself, you will learn to get yourselves on that ferry as soon as possible. There may be some among you who are already on that ferry. It's possible because you're earning merits every day. You offer arms to the Swami Nohan says, yeah, every Sunday, look at that. Eh? When did you think you were going to be able to do something like that weekly? Today you have that opportunity. In my lay life, I used to do it monthly because I, we never had a monk who would come with an arms round, on an arms round with an arms bowl on Pindapata. I never had that opportunity, but look at you. It used to be once a year many years ago, and then it became once a month. It never was once a week, until of course I ordained, and then it was every day. But now you get, up, get that opportunity once a week, which is fabulous. And, it, and remember, you don't have to offer anything, because it's not what you give that matters, it's the intention that you have that matters. That is what earns you merit. So even if you are someone in the audience who will sit by the side or stand by the side, Right? And just observe how people make that offering. And in your mind you go, you, you, you rejoice with the sadhukar. That is more than sufficient. Therefore, who earns the more merits? The rich man or the poor man? Who earns more merits? The rich man or the poor man? It's the wise man. Isn't it? Yes. It doesn't matter how much you have. It's the wise man who always earns merits. Are you all wise men? Good. Right, well, before we proceed then, let us all take a moment to pay homage to the Magnificent One, He who is our Savior, our Father, our Guide and our Master. It is because of Him today we have this pristine Dhamma to help us navigate the stream of Sansara and get across over to liberation. Let us also take this moment to observe the five precepts and make a firm resolve that in this new year may we make progress one day at a time, one week at a time, one moment, one chitta at a time to get ourselves to the ultimate bliss of Nibbana by taking refuge in the Noble Triple Gem. <clears throat> नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स Loving oneself, it's what we're here to learn. You probably feel that you already love yourselves. You probably think you do. And when you think you do, you think the purpose of Life and the way in which you have to show that love towards yourself is to make sure that you're always happy. There's nothing wrong about that. Of course, if you live, if you're alive, then being happy is part and parcel of that. Try and be happy as much as you possibly can. That's good. That's what we're all here to do. But you see, what you do to be happy is wrong, ladies and gentlemen. 
if you love yourself and then because you love yourself to show that love to oneself what you try to do is be happy but the way in which you are trying to be happy is wrong then unfortunately you don't love yourself truly you don't know how to love yourself you think you do but the things that you're doing are wrong let's take a simple example say you're walking along the streets and you walk past a shop say it's a clothes shop and you see something you like through the window now i've heard people say this oh that looks really nice i want to treat myself people say that don't they i want to treat myself my my birthday's coming up it's the new year it's christmas I, i've been very good lately i've kept my promise of not smoking this month so i want to treat myself people say that stop tober and all that yes so people say they want to treat themselves so they say i've been good at work right i've been working my socks off right lately i've been doing overtime and i've been you know really stressed exhausted putting 100% of myself into this i've been so good and i've been keeping to my diet huh now i want to treat myself so you now want to show love towards yourself isn't it that's what you want to do you want to treat yourself meaning you want to show love to yourself so then you look at you know you look through the glass and you see there's something in there let's say it's a watch a wrist watch or i said it's a clothes shop a clothes you know something some address that you think you like now what you think you ought to do is you ought to go into the store and buy it yes because you want to treat yourself because you want to show love towards yourself see growing up we always saw the people that we thought we love but we thought who love us do this for us your mother your father your friends your loved ones whenever they wanted to show love to you what did they do they did what to you they gave you something didn't they remember for your birthday if there was a birthday where you got nothing how did you feel you probably never had that experience i don't know have you but some birthdays where you never got anything or say some you know people forget your birthday usually as a child that doesn't tend to happen a lot but as you grow up right you know people they don't they care less about how old you are and they start caring more about what they can get out of you but when you are younger i your parents they dote on you right your your birthday is a big deal okay so for our birthdays we have this we've sort of uh, conditioned ourselves to think that if it's our birthday we must get something from others they call birthday gifts at least a card look at the culture that we've created for ourselves and the holes that we have dug for ourselves and the way that we fall into these pits and then suffer silly <laughs> honestly we've conditioned ourselves this way we have created a culture around ourselves we have created the society around ourselves and now we are a victim of our own creations i'm thinking at 100 miles an hour right now so i'm trying to slow myself down so i can take you on this journey look at how we have created a culture that causes ourselves to suffer we've created our own suffering let me talk this through with you in our minds in our heads we have this sentiment this notion that if someone loves us they have to they have to give us something don't you all share that sentiment most of you at least if someone loves us they have to give us something take valentines day on valentines like what do you expect for valentines don't be embarrassed come on flowers. yes flowers chocolates and you know and dinner out yeah maybe to the movies like take to the restaurant right get make get something nice maybe a necklace or a ring or something something like that at least a card at least 
Birthdays are no different. Then what about anniversaries? Those, those are the make or break ones, right, aren't they? Because anniversaries tend to be forgotten by a particular gender. You know which gender that is. <laughs> and then when that happens, how do you feel? You feel unloved. Just look at this, let's Really, I want you to think about this. We tend to associate love or the, the showing of love, the display of love, the demonstration of love by the simple fact that someone gives us something, something that we like. You know, this is what's really going on. They give us something to be fearful of. They give us worries, that's what they do. They give us something to be afraid of. Let me break that down for you. Let's say today's Valentine's Day and your loved one gives you a diamond necklace. I can see some of you going, yeah, like when that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, wishful thinking. You know. Keep dreaming, one day it might happen. <laughs> right? You get a diamond necklace. So this necklace you put around your neck. Then you go and stand in front of the mirror. You look at yourself, right? You're now very pleased about the fact that you have this necklace and you now feel that this person that has given this to you has shown their love for you. By doing what? By giving you this necklace. From the moment you put that on, ladies and gentlemen, here's what's going on behind the scenes. Until now you lived a life that was free of fear that something might happen to it. That was the problem of the person who owned it before you, until then. So if they got it from the jewelers, the jeweler had to keep it safe. But now who has to keep it safe? You got to keep it safe. Now who lives scared, dead scared that something might happen to it? That it might go missing, someone might snatch it, someone might steal it, it might, it might be destroyed, it might get lost. These are the fears that you have to now live with. And I want you to think about what your loved one has given you. You think they've given you a diamond necklace, but unbeknown to you, they've also given you something else, which we tend to completely ignore. They have given you fear on a plate. You no longer, you, until such time that you were gifted this, you didn't have any fear. You had no fear of, you don't have any fear of losing things you don't own, do you? No. But the moment you become the owner, now you also become the security guard. Now you have to secure it. You have to keep it safe. You are the one who has to worry about it. You, have the one, you are the one who has to be in fear of it, of losing it, of protecting it, keeping it safe. See, with this in mind, bearing this in mind, ask yourself, is that truly a display of love? I'm not saying from now on you should stop doing this, by the way. Okay, if you want, if that is how your loved one expects you to show your love for them, then give them whatever they're, they're asking for, give them whatever they want from you. Give it. I just want you to start thinking differently about how you want people to show you love and how you love yourself. When you walk outside that store, you look in there, and you think, I want to treat myself today. You walk in and you buy that wristwatch, you buy that dress, you buy that whatever thing you think is precious. Remember, you're walking out of that store, not with just that object, but also the fear that comes with it. While you have it, you live in fear. The moment you lose it, you live in grief or sorrow. You see, the moment you attach yourself to that object, ladies and gentlemen, you have just cursed yourself with these two things, fear and sorrow. Tell me the only way to get out of it. Give it away. 
No. Physically giving away something does not do it. I can prove that to you. Let's just say you think, you know what, I should give this away. I, I, I live in a lot of fear that something might happen, so I should give it away. So you call your, you call your, your sister and you say, sis, I don't need this anymore. Right? Here you go, you can have it. I'm thinking of making this a gift to you. And you give it to the sister. Now, yes, you no longer have to take care of the diamond necklace, but here's what you need to take care of. You need to check whether your sister is actually using it. So every time you go around her place, you ask her, that necklace? <laughs> I haven't seen you wearing it lately. Do you still have it? You haven't given up. You've given two, not given up. Giving two and giving up are different things. Because you're still mentally attached to it. Yes, it's not physically with you, but that mental attachment to that object is still there. It's not gone yet. So you still live in fear. You still in, live in fear of her not wearing it. So what is the only way to let, to, to let go of the fear that you have towards something? To let go of the attachment to it. Not physically, mentally. So again I ask you, if you truly tell me that you love yourself, do you think going out round, going shopping or you know, sightseeing and doing all the things that you think are going to make you happy, attaching yourself to things and trying to acquire those things is the way to show that love towards yourself? I ask you this question. If you want to show love to yourself, do you think the right way to go about that is to go getting all the things you love? all the things you want and all the things you like. But that's what we have been indoctrinated to do. That's what we have been conditioned to do. We think that that is the secret to happiness. That is the way that we love ourselves. That is what we have learned. I'm trying to show you the flaw in that. That's why you're never happy. How can you? Because you always sacrifice your happiness for a mere object. You know what people do day in, day out? They are born happy, okay? We are all born happy. But here's what we do throughout our lives. We give away bits of our happiness in exchange for material things. So that we can claim to be in possession of something. Either something or someone. We give away bits of our happiness. And you keep doing that for the best part of your life and then by the time you get to 60s, 70s, 80s, when it's you know, the last few years of your life, then you begin to wonder, where is my happiness? Where's the happiness that I was born with? That's why when you have, on a poor day, you go to any temple, what do you see? Grandfathers and grandmothers. Why are they now at the temple? Because what have they been doing all their lives? They were born happy and then they were given away all their happiness in exchange for property, for wealth, right, for material possessions, for children, for grandchildren, great-grandchildren, husbands, wives and all these things. In the end, they have a lot but they have lost everything. Isn't this the story of your lives? See, today, don't you have a lot? Just take a moment to think about all the things you have. You might actually feel, yeah, my goodness, I never realized I had so much. If you just take a moment to think about all the things you have, right? You have a house. Pretty much all of you will have a house. Then you'll have maybe another house. Then you have a holiday home. Right? Maybe you have a, a boat somewhere. Maybe you have a yacht. Maybe you have a jet. Maybe you have... 200 acres of coconut land. Maybe you have 500 acres of rubber land. Maybe you have another 1,000 acres in somewhere else. 1,000 <laughs> acres, that's a lot. Whatever you have. Maybe you have 10 cars parked outside. You have a big garage. Maybe you have a swimming pool at home. You have a tennis court. You have a, you have a big family. 
You have a house that most people would consider a hotel. Perhaps. Perhaps. You have a lot. Open your fridge. What's in there? A lot of stuff. Mentally walk into your kitchen. What do you have? A lot of stuff. Your living room, full of stuff. You are the envy of most people. Because you have a lot of stuff. A lot of material possessions, a lot of immaterial possessions, in any case, possessions. But in the end, these are all things that have actually chipped away at your happiness one at a time. Today you have become someone who has a lot, but don't have the very thing you came into this world looking for. Now that is a real pity. That's why I say, ladies and gentlemen, we need to learn to love ourselves better. We've lost, we've forgotten, we've unlearned somehow the truth about how to truly love ourselves. If you are someone who loves yourself, then I need you to see, I, sorry, I need to see you working on chipping away at attachment. That's when I will believe that you are someone who loves yourself. Because attachment is the demon that takes away your happiness every single time. Feeding your attachment is not the answer. But you watch TV, what do they tell you? Here's the next best thing that you have to buy. And all TV adverts will tell you what else you need, you need in your life, don't they? You take a, take a stroll down the street, there are billboards that tell you the next thing that you, have, you need in your life. They, they somehow paint a picture whereby your life is not complete without them. That's good marketing for you, good advertising. But you fall for that. And then you think, to be happy, I have to have these things in my life. You know, one of these days when you get back home, just have a, have a, have a browse around home and then make a list of the things that you, you never really wanted, but in the end you got them anyway. Because someone said your life was not complete until you had them. You'll have a long list. How many cars can you drive at once? Should I repeat myself? How many cars can you drive at once? Okay, so how many cars do you need then? How many bedrooms can you use at once? How many beds can you sleep in at once? How many bedrooms do you need then? How many beds do you need then? How many washrooms can you use at once? Sometimes some homes have more bedrooms and more washrooms than the number of people at home. Whenever I see houses like that, I go sadhu sadhu. You know, I've shared this with you before. Because I, I rejoice the fact that people have given and therefore today they get. I rejoice in that. I really cherish that. You know, to see how, how, how successful people have become, how prosperous people are, how wealthy people are. You know, that money doesn't need to be in my pocket. As long as, you know, when I see a rich man, I really rejoice in that. Because I know that the only way to get is to give. That much I know. So therefore, when I see a rich person, I, I really rejoice in that. I want all of us to be like that, because that, that is a rich man's mindset. A poor mindset, a, a poor man's mindset is always being jealous about people who have things. That is why they're always poor. Because they have a very poor man's mindset, so therefore they don't have the power of attraction. Nothing comes to them. Because they don't have a giving mindset. They don't rejoice in giving. So the first thing you want to do, if you want to be someone who has, is to appreciate having. Enjoy, rejoice in, when, rejoice in it when, when we see that people have things. But, I say, I give a sadhu card and then on the other hand I think to myself, I, I really hope that that man is not attached to all those things. Because having is one, being attached is another thing. I really hope that that man is not attached to them. Because what does attachment bring you? Suffering. <clears throat> this is why I keep emphasizing the fact, ladies and gentlemen, your task in the Buddha Sasana is not about giving up your material possessions physically. Keep them. Keep all of them. If you need more, acquire more. That's perfectly fine. 
you just need to learn to give up mentally because we are here to deal with mental agony mental pain mental fear mental suffering your mental pain your mental suffering has nothing to do with what you're physically holding on to so if you have three cars then you have three cars that's okay but i ask you if you're attached to not three cars but half a car you'll still suffer you still suffer But the thing is this though, if you have three cars and you have to look after those three cars, you have to take care of them, you have to keep it safe, you have to pay the bills, you have to repair them, you have to get them serviced, all this work, the extra work that comes with having three cars, it comes to you. If you have a big house and you have to, you have to clean the house, you have to sweep the house, you have to remove the cobwebs, you have to maintain your house. Yes, you can say, well, I don't have to do that Swami Nansa because I have, I have a maid who comes down and does all that for me. Well, you have to pay her. And then you have to make sure that she doesn't get up to no good while, while she's on duty. So then you have to install CCTV cameras to watch her every move. You can't delegate fear. You can delegate the work, not fear. When your mother dies, can you delegate crying and being grieving to someone else? A loved one dies, can you delegate grieving to someone else? No, you can't do that. Because suffering is where attachment is. Wherever there is attachment, there suffering lies. So if that's where suffering lies, then you can't delegate suffering. You can delegate a task, you can delegate a responsibility, you can delegate an activity, but you can't delegate suffering. Suffering is yours if attachment is yours. So the long and short of this is, folks, I need all of us to have a plan and work on to a, to a strategy whereby at the end of this effort that you're making, part of which is you being here today, you find a way to free yourself from attachment. What kind of attachment am, to, am I talking of? Mental attachment. If you can put your hand up and say, Swami Nanza, I have no fear I have no grief, I have no, I don't, get, I don't get bothered, I don't get annoyed, you know, there are things I have, but if they, if they fall apart, if they lose, if they, you know, get destroyed in a fire, it doesn't bother me at all. Then honestly, we have nothing to talk about, because you are a free man. These sermons are purposefully designed for that, to achieve that, a state where you can be free of suffering. To be free of suffering, you have to be free of attachment. So how does one get themselves to be free of attachment? How does one get there? How do you free yourself from attachment? That is the crux of our discussion then. That's what we need to talk about. How do you free yourself from attachment? Why are we trying to free ourselves from attachment? Once again, because attachment brings suffering. And do you suffer when you have it or when you don't have it? Both. Yeah? So if you are attached, then there is no respite. You have to suffer, full stop. So the only way to free yourself from suffering is to free yourself from attachment. And that is why our discussion needs to be focused on how does one free oneself from attachment? Are we all clear on that? That's what we're here to do. If you learn how to free yourself from attachment, then you can claim to be someone who loves yourself. I will only accept the fact that you love yourself if you have learned how to free yourself from attachment. So now let's try and focus our conversation on how one is able to free oneself from attachment. Do you remember what we discussed a couple of weeks ago? That was two weeks ago, Swami Nansa. <laughs> what do you expect? We've, we, we've been out of the camera <laughs> since then. This is the difference in environment. That's why I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Hmm? You're like a pot plant, didn't I say? Yeah, when you want a bit of sunlight, you put it out. But then, soon enough, you have to take it back in. The difference between you and I is not in our potential for Nibbana, not one bit. You are just as capable of attaining to Nibbana as I am. No difference there. 
The difference between you and I is the environment. Your seed is as potent as mine, but you are a pot plant you put out in the sun every Sunday morning. But I am a plant that's out in the sun. I was planted in the sun, so therefore I get sunlight whenever the sun is out. That is why I encourage you and invite you to bring yourselves into the environment as much as you possibly can. So no wonder if you don't remember what we talked about a fortnight ago, because it was a fortnight ago. <laughs> How do you expect to remember all that? All right, so let's quickly recap what we talked about then. Because I want to continue that conversation, but let's do a quick recap. So we were talking about objects and how we have this attachment to objects and why we have this attachment to objects. I remember we talked about flowers. We took the example of a gardener who likes his or her flowers. You like flowers because they are pretty, they smell nice, okay, they are soft to the touch. <clears throat> These are some of the reasons why you like flowers, but mainly because they look pretty. They're beautiful, aren't they? Would you still love, like flowers if they weren't beautiful? Would you? I don't mean practically, right, you know, flowers, you know, they help pollination and, you know, they bring the, 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 you know, the birds and the bees to your garden. That, I'm not talking about that stuff. Like, just flowers. Would you invest your time and energy in growing flowers if you didn't think they were beautiful? That's why not, everyone's a, uh, not everyone grows flowers. Because some enjoy them, some don't. Yeah? So, those who do, they grow flowers at home because they enjoy flowers because if you ask them why, the answer for that is because they are beautiful. You like what they look like, you like how they smell and so on. So if we were able to convince to you that beauty is not in the flower, would you, not, would you any longer have a need for flowers? Take these flowers for example. These flowers, it's beautiful. If I was somehow able to take the beauty out of these flowers, would you still keep them there? So whoever's used this to decorate this, the setup today, they put them there, you ask them why, they'd say, it's pretty, it's beautiful, that's why we put it there. So if beauty was in the flowers, and we were able to take it out of it, okay? Say there was a chemical I had, and if I dip this, these flowers in that chemical, a chemical bath, and then take it out, and the beauty is gone. The flowers are there, but the beauty is gone. Okay? This hypothetical situation. Would you still use these flowers to decorate the room? You wouldn't. Think, think about a wedding. Think about any other occasion where you used flowers to decorate the room. Yeah? You only put flowers out there because they look pretty, they look beautiful, they give you beauty. That's the feeling that we have. So if beauty is not in the flower, you wouldn't use them to decorate, would you? In other words, you grow your flowers at home because they are pretty, they're beautiful. You're working on the assumption that they are beautiful. Are they really? Is a question I want to ask you. These flowers that you claim to be beautiful, I ask you, are they really beautiful? Before you give me an answer, you need to learn the Dhamma. Because right now you might say, yes, Swami, no, so they are beautiful, look at them. It's nice, you know, this is a nice little pink here, a bit of violet here, it's nice, you know, nice combination. Look at all those flowers, you know, we, I, I wish we could have more, you might say. In fact, if I leave it out here and someone really, really, really likes this, you know, you come up here to worship me, by the time I look here, look back, it's gone. 
If you really, really, really like this, sometimes people thieve, they steal because they think beauty is in the object. That's why they thieve. That's why they steal things. Why did the boy next door run away with the girl? Because he thought she was beautiful. That's why they eloped. Whenever you think beauty is in an object, you want that object to be in your possession because you love yourself. That's why. See, these are the ways in which you show love to yourself. You understand showing love to another person by giving them something they like? Yeah? When it's, when it's, your, when it's your child's birthday, when it's your friend's birthday, you give them a present, you give them a gift. When do you give yourself gifts? When do you give yourself gifts? All the time, yes. You give yourself gifts all the time. As you open your eyes and you look at these flowers, what are you doing right now? Giving yourselves gifts, of course. That's what you're doing right now. Okay, have a good look. Give yourself some gifts then, go on. But you can only do that if you think that they're beautiful. If you are someone in the room who looks at them and go, I, my God, what awful, whose choice is this? What an eyesore. If you, if you think that these flowers, these arrangements, the way that they arrange the colors, right, the combinations, if you think that this is not a nice flower arrangement, it would be a punishment to you. In fact, then you would gift yourself by shutting your eyes and not look at it. But if you think that this, flower, this floral arrangement is nice, you like the colors, Right? You are gifting yourself by opening your eyes and scanning the room and looking at these flowers because you think the flowers have beauty. I have a question to you. Are they really beautiful? Well, let's find out. When you say something's beautiful, how do you know? Let's look at the mechanism of how beauty works. You're talking about a sight. So a sight requires your eyes to be taken in. Right? Here's the flower. Through your eyes you see. Can you see this at the back? Yeah, the screen's working? Is the overhead projector working? Okay. So your eyes, you open your eyes and you look at the flowers. When you see these flowers, your brain takes in signals from your eyes through the optic nerve and then your mind somehow interfaces with your brain, right? So this is how I represent the mind because it's something that arises and passes away. You know, it's your mind that sees beauty, not your physical eye, yeah? So your, your eye and all of these organs, all of these devices are working on behalf of your mind, aren't they? That's why you have your eyes. You have your eyes to serve your mind. So your mind is the master, the rest of you are slaves. The rest of you as in the rest of your body are all slaves. So your mind is the master. Now the mind wishes to see beauty, so therefore the mind opens the eye which is what you just did a moment ago. You looked at the room because you wanted to gift yourself, because you love yourself, of course. And then you think you see beauty. What is this beauty? Let's try and understand what beauty is. What is beauty? Beauty is when you see, when you, when you say that a sight is quite pleasant. When a sight brings you happiness and joy, that's when you say it's beautiful, isn't it? All in agreement with that. When you say a sight brings you pleasantness and joy and happiness, that's when you say it's beautiful. So when is something ugly? Well, the opposite of that. When a sight does not bring you happiness, in fact, it takes away your happiness, it makes you angry, it makes you upset, it makes you feel sick, then you say it's ugly, it's a sight I don't want to see. So the reason you want to see these flowers around me, you think this is beautiful, is because you think as you look at this sight, you are happy 
this flower, these flowers make you happy. That's why on Valentine's or on your birthday, someone comes up to you and gives you a, a bunch of flowers, you go, thank you so much. That you have no idea how happy that makes me. You say that. It's not merely the fact, the action of giving you flowers. What the flowers are, the arrangement of the flowers, the colors, all of that have a part to play. Because what if they came and gave you some dead flowers? Would that still make you happy? No. So, you know, what my, my point is, it's not merely the fact that they are giving you something. That something also matters to you, what that something is. Are they pretty flowers? Have they understood me? You know, are they beautiful flowers? There's, of course, the element of, you know, the fact that they've thought about me, right? That also makes you happy. Yeah, so they, they've thought about me enough to actually bring me flowers. They, they've thought about me enough to remember my birthday. <laughs> That's also good. But the fact that the flowers are pretty also impresses you because it makes you happy. Now then, let's see how beauty works. First of all, you're seeing a sight. Let's break down what a sight is. Because once we understand what a sight is, let, ne next we'll get to what beauty is. Okay? Because beauty is in the sight, isn't it? Right now you're looking at an image, you're looking at an object. Okay? And then you're saying that the, the, that the, the object is beautiful. What's beautiful here? What's beautiful? The flowers are beautiful. So this is an object. For all intents and purposes, this is an object. So what you're saying is this, this object is beautiful. Okay? How do you know there's an object here? Because you can see, right? You, I mean, I'm holding on to it, but you are only seeing this. So you know there's an object here because you can see. In other words, sight is the gift that you give yourself to confirm that there's an object here. But the, you're, you're not just looking at this because it is a sight. It's just another sight. It's because it's beautiful. Before beauty comes the sight. So really, if I were to... First you have the object, from that you have sight, and from that you have beauty. Does that kind of make sense to you? First of all, there's the object that's in the outside world. Sight is the mechanism through which you take an impression of the, out of the outside world object into your mind, and then you somehow claim that you make an evaluation of that, of that sight and say the object is beautiful. Right. The eye is only capable of taking in light rays. We, we've know this, we know this because we've done a bit of science at school, so we know that the eye is only capable of picking up light rays. You know that the object does not pass through your eyes, it's only light waves. So this object is bouncing off light energy that is falling on it, and it's reflecting that light energy, and your eye is picking up some of that. Not all of it, but some of it. In the back of your eye, you have some cells that are sensitive to these pulses of energy. And what they do is, at the moment that these pulses fall on it, it generates electrical current, which the brain picks up. And then, by interfacing with the mind, a chitta is born. So we call it eye consciousness or sight consciousness. In the Pali, it is said, Chakkuncha paticca rupecha upachati chakku vinyana. In other words, when the eye comes into contact with sight, or, or a rupa, you have chakku vinyana, which is the eye consciousness. In other words, now you are seeing something. This is how the mind works. This is what you are. You are now seeing something. At the point you are seeing something, ladies and gentlemen, we can say now sight has been born. Okay? When sight is born, object, sight and beauty. When sight is born, we tend to make judgments about this sight, we tend to make assessments about this sight and we evaluate this sight. Based on our evaluations, we start to make statements which we feel are general truths about the object. One such evaluation is beauty. Now, you agree, I'm sure, with me that not everyone finds the same object beautiful. 
Some people do, others don't. In other words, this will be beautiful to some of you, but it won't be to others. But everyone sees it the same way. But not everyone assesses it the same way. Which one of these is objective, which one is subjective, do you think? So here's the object. The object has to be objective, I mean, that's why it's called an object. But what about sight and beauty? Which one's objective, which one's subjective? Which one's the objective one? Sight is objective. Which one's the subjective one? Beauty is subjective. How do we know this? How do we know this? By a simple survey. Just doing a simple survey, simple as that. Not everyone finds the same object beautiful. So if not everyone finds the same object beautiful, only some do and others don't, then we have to come to the conclusion that beauty is not in the object, only for some it's beautiful, for others it's not. Meaning that beauty is not objective, but rather it is subjective. But every specimen in your sample will agree that they have seen the object. Put your hand up if you cannot see this. Well, there you go. Therefore, it's objective. But I can also ask a question. Put your hand up if you think this is beautiful. Some will put their hands up, others won't. Once again, what does that prove to us? Sight is objective. Beauty is subjective. Can you agree with me then, please, that beauty is not in the object? Yes? Beauty is not in the object. But how do you see beauty then? If beauty is not in the object, how do you see it? Magic. How do you see something that's not here? Isn't that like seeing an apparition? It's like seeing a ghost. Can you see the ghost behind me? So, how do you see, I mean, if you're telling me that beauty is here, then you can, I, I, I presume you can also see ghosts, because you're seeing something that I don't see. Beauty is not in this, but don't you see it? Hmm? You see beauty, but it's not in the object, so how do you see it? This is the question that we need to ask. Why do we need to ask this question? Why do we care? Why do we care where beauty comes from? Going back to the first question I asked you. What do you do when you love yourself? To demonstrate love for yourself, what do you do? You acquire things, don't you? You acquire things of what? Things of beauty. Once you've acquired it, now who has to look after it? And who suffers when you lose it? You do. Who has to grieve? Who has to be in fear? You do. So, you, you acquire this object because you think it's beautiful. And then once you've acquired it, you're the one who has to suffer because you think that's what you do for, out of love for yourself. But all that is based on the, on the simple illusion that you have that this is beautiful. If you were able to understand that beauty is not in the flower and you were able to understand, well then where does this beauty come from? Hopefully that's what we can get to. Then you will realize that there's no point in attaching myself to this object. And once you are able to not attach to this object, you will no longer want it in your life. Therefore you will not want to acquire it. And what happens if you don't need to acquire it? No fear, no grief. See, I'm teaching you how to love yourself. Because you still don't know how. You think you do. And all you're doing is really causing misery for yourselves. You're bringing in misery into your lives by, by, by doing all the wrong things in the name of love. Once again, let me explain to you the logic behind this. Right? I want you all to, be, to engage with this conversation because this is to help you folks. Nothing more. This is to help you. I want you all to walk out of this room today at least having understood that beauty is not something in an object. It is not intrinsic. It is not a characteristic of an object. And therefore, any thoughts that I have, that you have, 
to acquire an object in the name of beauty because you think that's a way in which you can treat yourself because, that you, because you want to show love to yourself is completely and utterly meaningless. If you can get yourself to that point, you will stop punishing yourself in the name of love. You punish yourself in the name of love because you think beauty is in objects. Therefore, you want to acquire them. See, if this was beautiful and this was for sale, won't you buy it? Won't you buy it? This is beautiful. You think it's beautiful and it's for sale. Won't you buy it? That's how you buy anything. You think it's beautiful. Now you want to buy it. So if you want to buy it, you walk up to me and you, you pay, you ask me how much, I say five dollars. You give me the money, you walk away with this. I've got myself five dollars, you've got yourself what? Grief and sorrow and fear. Why? You know, the first step to your monkhood, because I'm always talking about a monk's attitude before we get into a monk's livelihood. Okay? The first step to your monk's attitude, ladies and gentlemen, is for you to recognize that the physical world that you live in today is not a source of happiness. Because for as long as you think the physical world that you live in today is the world that keeps you happy, you will not be able to detach yourself from that world. You will always want to be at home. So no matter, even if the Buddha came up to here and gave you a sermon, if they're not able to show you and convince you that the physical world that you live in is not a source of happiness, but merely your attachments to them bring you fear and grief and suffering, you will never be able to let go of that. You know why you're still at home and I'm at the monastery? Do you know why? Why are you still at home and I have chosen a life of monkhood and I'm at a monastery? One of two reasons. One of two reasons. One. In your, now I'm arguing on your case, on your side, duties and responsibilities. Now I'm on your side, duties and responsibilities. If you have duties and responsibilities, then fair enough. Two, second reason, you're attached to the physical world that you live in. You can't let go of it. Because you can't get, let go of it, you can't consider at least a better life. You don't get to enjoy the joy that I do. <laughs> a happy man is not a man who has a lot. A happy man is a man who doesn't want a lot. You have a lot. I don't want a lot. I used to want a lot. But then I realized that beauty is not in the flower. Then I didn't want it. Now I don't care whether I have it or not. But you still want it because you think that beauty is in the flower. Therefore you want this. Therefore when I invite you to come and join our ranks, you can't because you know that the Buddha does not allow a Swami Nuhase to keep flowers in his kuti. <laughs> you can offer it to the Buddha as a Buddha puja, but you can't decorate your kuti with flowers. So then when I invite you, you think, oh no, how can I do that? Because I need my flowers. You know, by flowers I mean everything else as well. Yeah? I'm giving you an example that I can talk about in a sermon. There are lots of things that I cannot mention in a sermon, certainly not in public. Think about all the things you're attached to. Take sensuality, for example. <clears throat> sensuality. You still have lustful thoughts, don't you? Don't nod. No, this is not to embarrass anyone. Honestly. I love you. I don't want to embarrass you. I love you and I want to show you how to love yourself. You have lustful thoughts. And you enjoy them. What you don't realize is, this is a punishment that you give yourself. So therefore you like to surround yourself with the things that give rise to desire in your mind. 
When you have lustful thoughts, when you have sensual thoughts, you think that that is, a, that is fun. That's enjoyable. That's good. But the truth is, that is a situation, a state where your mind goes into a deep state of insanity. It's crazy. The mind is crazy when it goes, when it feels lust. It's madness. Until you realize that, that, that lust is, is, is synonymous with suffering. Don't take my word for it because my word is not going to make any change for you. And I can sit here and sing till the cows come home and I can tell you, lust is simply suffering, but you will not believe me until it becomes true for you. And so therefore it has to become true for you. But here's the thing, for as long as you feel that way, that you enjoy having lustful thoughts and desire and things like that, you are not able to even consider the life of a brahmachari. You are not able to consider the noble life. This is called a noble life not because we are celibate. I mean a cow is celibate for the most part of its life. Right? Celibate, being celibate is, is, is overrated. It's not about being celibate. It's about not wanting that in your life. You know, what's the deal? Someone wants it but they live without a partner. They suffer, don't you think? That's suffering. Isn't that why every year, in just one Nikaya, like one, we have several Nikayas in the, the Buddhist ministry, not the Buddha's ministry, the Buddhist ministry. In the Buddha's ministry there were no Nikayas, we were all part of the same purpose to Nibbana, but later on right, it became political. That's what happened. So it, in just one Nikaya, every year, 2,000 monks disrobe. 2,000. That's only one Nikaya. I think by this count, by, by now, we have about just over 25,000 monks in Sri Lanka. <laughs> 25,000 monks. That's all you have to give a, non, a Dani to. Most temples are now empty. No monks in temples. They lie bare. But those days, in the great kingdoms, like Anuradha, Guru, Polonar, and so on, there weren't enough temples to house the monks. So the kings in the day, they, they kept on building monasteries, <coughs> large, massive monasteries, so that many hundreds of thousands of monks could be homed. But today, it's going to ruins. They have become business places, you know, shops. Because the monk's attitude has not been put into people's minds. Just putting, shaving one's head and put a robe on does not make one a monk. You have to have the monk's attitude. In other words, at least someone who comes into the sasana must understand that beauty is not in the flower. At the very least. I'm not even talking about the fact that there is no such thing called a self. That's much further down the line. But at least to understand that beauty is not in the flower. Because what if the monk one day wants to see flowers? Because he thinks that the beauty is in the flower. Now he can't do that in robes. What does he have to do? Disrobe and go back home. You can substitute anything with this flower. Substitute this with, with anything. I talk about flowers, what about women? Same thing. Food, same thing. Property. If someone comes into the sasana thinking that a woman is beautiful, that beauty is in a woman, right? The next time he sees a man walk into the monastery or the temple with a woman as his arm candy, now what's the, what's the monk going to think? Oh, how I wish I could be with her. I mean, how many days can you be patient like that? Then he goes into his kuti, right? He can't meditate, he can't focus on anything because his mind is constantly thinking about, thinking about the, the woman. And then he begins to fantasize. And then before long, he feels you know, he can no longer be in robes because either he has to be unvirtuous, an unvirtuous monk in a robe, or far better, to disrobe and go back home and live a lay life. I mean, that is far more respectable. 
If you can't do the practice of a monk, you have to go back. But what has he gone back to really? You think it's lay life. What has he really gone back to? You think he's gone back to lay life, right? What has he really gone back to? A pit of infinite suffering. That's what he's gone back to. Here's a man who has accumulated enough merits throughout many births in sansara to come into the pure Buddha Sasana. But unfortunately because he had no teacher, unfortunately because he had no Dhamma, he's now gone back again. All those merits have been consumed. What a pity. So the same goes for you as well, ladies and gentlemen. For as long as you believe that your pleasures come from the physical world, you will not be able to even consider the holy life. It's not called holy because, of, because we are celibate. That's not why it's called holy. It's called holy because this is the only path to happiness. This is where true happiness lies. That's why it's called holy. The happiness that you enjoy in your life lives is not true happiness. And I'll prove it to you time and a hundred times, a hundred times over I'll prove it to you. If you can prove to me one time that no Swami no answer, happiness is in lay life. I'm prepared to disrobe today. I'll come back home with you today and I'll be, a, I'll be your servant for three months because I've been lying to you for the last six. Prove to me once that your life is ha happier than mine. That you actually enjoy true happiness and not simply relief from vexation. Prove to me just once, just once, and I'll give you a thousand examples. You give me one if you can. I'm prepared to disrobe. My monkhood is on the line. Come on. You've got nothing to lose. You get a free servant out of it for three months. You've got to think why I speak with such conviction. Why am I making such a bold claim? Because I know that you still haven't seen the truth. And the truth that we have seen in the Buddha Sasana, thanks to my teachers, thanks to the Buddha, it's a truth that cannot be made an untruth. It cannot be turned around. It is the truth. It is the ultimate truth. Please, ladies and gentlemen, try and understand that happiness is not in the material objects that you surround yourselves with. For your sake, try and understand that. Because if you can't let go of your attachment to these physical things, my God, you will suffer no end. You know that one day you're going to have to let go of them, don't you? Whether you like it or not. Today you think you have a choice. You don't want, you, you, you think, you have a choice, you can put this away. But there's going to be a day you're going to die with this in your hand. Not being able to go, let go of it. Mentally you're still attached to it. Now you suffer. And that it doesn't end there, unfortunately. And you know, here's the thing. Let's say you need to understand this amount of Dhamma before you actually completely realize that happiness is not in the material objects. This amount you need to understand. You've understood so much, but there's this much more to go. You've understood so much and you die. Do you remember, what do you remember from your previous birth? What do you remember from your previous birth? What was your name last time round? You don't remember the first thing about yourself. So, if you don't understand this much and you die only having understood this much, you are back to zero. Now start again. Start again. That's why I ask you, are Sunday mornings enough? I mean, forgive me. I speak passionately because I care. I mean, if all I had to do was come here and do a sermon, you, give, you offer some pedicure at the end of the... The, the, the sermon, I take your pedicure and go away. I mean, that's fine, I take it to boot, right? We're happy. You're happy, I'm happy, we've done a sermon, right? Job done. I've done my duty, you've done your duty, but what, what's the freaking point? That's not what we're here for. I need you to be serious about Nibbana. 
not for my sake. My teachers are looking after me and they're doing it like nobody's business, right? So I have no trouble there, I have no problem there. I'm, I come here, I earn some merits out of doing the sermon, of course. And I'm happy to be here. Of course. But I need you to really learn to love yourselves. What you're doing in the name of love for yourself, by acquiring things one at a time, one day at a time, one item at a time, one object at a time, you're sitting on a ticking time bomb. Did you ask? You're sitting on a ticking time bomb. Can't you hear the tick tock, tick tock, tick tock? Name one thing you're attached to that you're also not fearful of losing. Give me one thing you're attached to that you don't worry, you don't care about losing it. And if you say that this is something that you don't care about losing, Swami Nansa, then you're also saying, I'm not attached to it. You can't be attached to something and then not be afraid of losing it. They are part and parcel of each other. I mean, you know, just think about it. Today you're happy with your families. Right? You have your husband for, look, who looks after you. You have your wife who loves you. You have your children who's there for you. You have your parents, maybe elderly, but they're still there for you. You know, one by one they're going to go. There's nothing you can do to stop that. What guarantee can you give me that you will get back home safe today? You know you're dead scared when you get into traffic, don't you? Get onto the motorway, get onto the highway, and you see how people drive. You can't change that. We, you know, we can't make the roads more disciplined. I mean, that that will take forever. But think about what's going to happen to you in the meantime. You know, it's a miracle that you're still alive. How many strokes does it take to put you down? Yesterday, you're a very important man, right? You are a VVVVIP, maybe. You have a lot of money, you have a lot of prestige, you have honor, right? People regard you highly, they salute you when you walk into the room, they wake, they stand up and say, good morning, sir, right? They do all that for you. But how many strokes does it take to put you down on your bed? How many? How many heart attacks does it take to paralyze you? One. When's the next one coming? You hear about this happening to other people, but you never stop to think that it's also going, it's also, it could also happen to you until it bites you. You know, take certain charities, actually pretty much all of them, Let's take a, a charity that works against cancer. Most of the people who donate towards that cause are people who have been affected by cancer. Either directly or indirectly. Most people who donate towards that are people who have been affected by that. Take Alzheimer's. This is a society called the Alzheimer's Society. People who donate towards that cause are either people who have been affected or people who have been directly or indirectly affected. What does that tell you? Read between the lines. The British Heart Foundation. People, most people who donate to us that are people who have been directly or indirectly affected by it. What does that tell you about? Why do they start donating after the fact? Because now you realize it could also happen to you. Until then it happens to others, not me. So if you can't let go of your attachment to this object, if you think beauty is in the flower, the day I take this away from you, you are going to suffer. If this is your child, if this is your child, 
the day I take this away from you, you're going to suffer. I'm God, you know. You're an accident waiting to happen. Aren't you? This is why I say, you know, be heedful. Have some, have a sense of earnestness. It is on your behalf, ladies and gentlemen, not on mine. You have to do this. It's not a choice. Right? Getting yourselves a good education is a choice. It might feel like, no, Swami Nasa, if you don't get a good education, we have to live, we have to live a poor life and, you know, then we, we won't be able to do all the things that we want to do. If you don't get yourself a good education, the worst that's going to happen is you might have to not, you won't be able to get everything you want. That others might have more than you, but you may not. The others might get a better job, but you may not. Right? That's the worst that can happen. But if you don't understand the Dhamma, it's not the same. But think about what parents invest in. Most parents are quite happy to invest in their child's education. But how much do they actually invest in giving their child an exposure to the Dhamma? If you love yourself, I tell you, expose yourself to the Dhamma and understand the Dhamma. Then what about if you love your children? It's the same thing. I know, I, 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 it sounds like I keep going around in circles, every day we talk about this, about your children, about yourself, but this is because this is serious. It may not seem like serious, but this is serious. Practicing the Dhamma is not an optional subject, it's a mandatory subject of your life. It's mandatory, because this is the only place where you're going to get some answers. If you don't let go of your attachment to material objects, the day you die, you'll be sorry. You'll be sorry that you didn't heed my advice. People, they don't stay dead. You won't stay dead. Trust me. There are those among you who have experience of this. There are those among you who, walk, who come up to me and say, Swami Nansa, my father, he passed away, but I think he's come back. My grandmother, she passed away, but I think she's come back. She's bothering my children now. What must I do? These are some of the questions I get asked. Because they weren't able to let go of the material object. So now they keep coming back. Remember, death is merely the body breaking down. Nothing happens to the mind. Death is merely the body breaking down. That's it. So once the body breaks down, now the mind needs another body to take place. That's all. It, it finds another home and then it continues. When your car breaks down, what do you do? Do you just remain stranded in the middle of the road? Forever and ever and ever? No, you call, you call a recovery service. They bring you a car right? or they tow you in and you're back on the road. That's what they do. And the same thing happens. When your body breaks down, your mind finds another body and it continues. The, the, you know, it's such a shame that today people have sought refuge in science, like I used to be. They think only what is visible is available. Only what we can hear is there, nothing else is there. How foolish. We have become a victim of our own success, unfortunately. People have taken refuge in science today and this science is yet to actually come up to the truth. Right? Today we talk about the visual spectrum. I mean, take that as a simple example of the, of the entire spectrum of electromagnetic waves. The visual spectrum is such a small proportion of it. Less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum is the visual spectrum. That's all you can see. What about the rest you cannot see? Just because you can't see doesn't mean something's not there. Is the pen not here? Hmm? Is there no pen behind this? You can't say yes now because you're a scientist. If you have sought refuge in science, then you have to say, no, Swami, there's no pen there. 
Ah, now there's a pen. No, there's no pen, Swami Nansen. Just because you can see doesn't mean it's... Just because you cannot see doesn't mean it's not there. You know, when you, when you die, folks, you know, it won't matter who you are. It won't matter that you've been a colonel in the army. It won't matter. It won't matter that you've been a professor. It won't matter. Because in that, in that land, they don't care who you are. They only care about what you've done. That's all they care about. Your deeds will be, will be the only refuge. Your merits and your demerits. I honestly need you to take this seriously. That's why we, we learn the Dhamma, to, to understand that there is, no, there is no beauty in the material objects. For as long as you believe that there is beauty here, you will continue to keep attaching yourself to it. And you won't be able to let go. There is more to the Dhamma than merely understand that there is no beauty here. But that's a start. That's where you have to begin. You know, I need you to work your way into the Sambuddha Sasana because you need the environment. We all do. I'm, I'm no special. The reason I have ordained myself is because I know that I need the environment in which I can grow. So if that is true for me, is that not true for you? I can understand an excuse like duties, responsibilities, too old. I understand that. Too weak, too frail. I understand that. For those, still. It's the same paper we have to write. Doesn't matter what age you are. Whether you're a man or woman, we both have to take, take the same test. Whether you're ordained or not, we all have to take the same test. Whether you're black or white, whether you're rich or poor, we all have to say, take the same test. But coming into the sasana, I think today, from where I stand today, folks, I feel it's an essential part of one's practice. It's not an optional part. That's, the, that's my personal opinion. Disagree with me if you like, that, that's okay. Not everyone will agree with everything I have to say, that's fine. But I'm speaking on your behalf. Let's hope this is true. Let's hope what I'm saying is true on your behalf. Otherwise the Buddha wouldn't come into this world and establish a Buddha Sasana. Create a community of monks and, and nuns. Why would he, if this was an optional part of one's practice? And the Buddha goes on to say, he dips a strand of hair into the, into, the, into the water, water, picks it up and says, Ananda, do you see the amount of water that is on the end of this hair as I dip this out of the, into the water and picked it back up? And Ananda says, yes. Venerable Sir, what is it that you try to convey? Ananda, in my Buddha Sasana, in my ministry, this is, the, this is the amount of people who will actually attain to the noble fruits in this Buddha Sasana. What about the rest of them, Venerable Sir? asks Ananda Theru. He says, Ananda, the rest is like the vast ocean into which I have dipped this strand of hair. They will not attain the noble fruits in this Buddha Sasana. The vast ocean compared to a few drops of water hanging on the thread or on a strand of hair. He was not making a guesstimate. He knew it. So among you there are those who are entitled to be those drops on the strand of hair. Among you they are. I speak to you to invite you to come along. Be part of that journey. Love yourself. Free yourself from suffering. You know, today you, you are in a riddle, aren't you? Today you've attached yourself to these objects. You can't let go now. Think about, think about the riddles you've gotten yourselves into. The traps that you've gotten yourselves into. You know, when you were, when you were youthful, right, someone walked up to you and said, to be happy you've got to get married. So you did. Today you begin to understand that marriage or the, you know, another person is not the source of happiness. Happiness is within. But now what can you do? It's too late. Because of course we are bound by duties and responsibilities and obligations and all that. Right? In a society, if we live in society, we have to play by the rules of society. So either they have to be willing to let you go 
Or there doesn't seem to be another answer. We can't take you on even as a monk or an anagarika if your other half does not agree, does not approve of it. Look at the trap you got yourself into. Now it's too late for some people. And then later down the line, someone said, to be happy you have to have kids. So you went ahead and made, had kids. Today, don't you suffer? I'm not against having kids, honestly. The more the merrier. Not for you, for them. If you suffer X amount on behalf of one child, you suffer two X on behalf of two children. Because they both have to leave home and go to school. On the way, anything could happen. While they're at school, anything could happen. On the way back, anything could happen. As a mother, as a father, you live in... This is hell on earth. Parents? Yes or no? There you go. You know, there's nothing you can think of now because your children, they've completely consumed you. Because someone said, having children is the, way to, is the way to be happy. That did you ever stop to ask whether people who have children are truly happy? You never did. And even if you had, they wouldn't have told you the truth. Because they didn't know an, an alternative. This is the alternative. See, if this is your children, they don't bring you happiness. Children don't bring you happiness. I'm not anti-children, by the way. We have more children than you do at our monastery. 160 of them, all of them under 18, between the ages of 6 and 18, 160 of them. When you are fed up of your children, you pass them over to us. So clearly, I am not anti-children, but I am pro-Nibbana. So if a child has potential to attain Nibbana, then give them every chance, give them every opportunity to do so. But I'm talking to those who are still attached to their children so much so that they won't let their children let go either. Well, I'm telling you this. One day you're going to have to let them go. And if you can't let them go mentally, you will come back for them. And then you will end up in a bottle. In the middle of the ocean. Because people will want you, want you gone. And then they'll say, good riddance. See, either listen to this Kattadiya, okay? Either listen to this Kattadiya, or another Kattadiya will come to catch you and put you in a bottle. Parents, take this seriously. You are not a parent, you are just a mind that is attached. That's all you are. You think you are a parent. You think you are a parent because you look at your child and you think that is your child. No such thing is true. That is only a conventional truth. The absolute truth is not that. You are just a mind and matter. The child is also mind and matter. Minds attached, then suffer. That's it. You can tell yourself that you are a parent. That's a conventional truth. Then there will be rules and regulations. There will be a constitution that says that parents should look after their children. There will be rules that say that children are the property of their parents. That's a convention. But that's not the absolute truth. What really happens is governed by absolute truths. We try and make sense of the world through conventional truths because they are for convenience, that's all. Live a conventional life but understand the absolute truth because the absolute truths are what determines what's eventually going to happen to you. So, I need you to understand this. 
Beauty is objective or subjective? Beauty is subjective. This is subjective. The sight is objective. But why is it that you see beauty in objects? Why are you attached to your children? Why are you attached to material things? It's because you see beauty in objects. And that is because you are vexed about them. When the mind is vexed, because the mind has attachment, the mind goes into vexation. Here's how it works. When a mind believes that a particular object can bring it happiness, this is what we call avidya, ignorance. <clears throat> this is one form of ignorance, to think that an object can bring you happiness. That's a form of ignorance. When you have that ignorance, now you want it. When you have the ignorance that an object can bring you happiness, what happens next? You want it. Who wants it? The mind wants it. Which mind? The mind that thinks that beauty is in an object. When I say object, I don't, necess I don't mean just material objects. It could be people, it could be other th things. In it could be the sunset. It could be a rainbow. It could be anything. Anything out there. Okay? Then you want it. When the mind wants something and it's not there, the mind goes into a state called a state of vexation. The mind vexes. Do you know what vexation feels like? Do you? I'll give you some examples. When you're waiting for something to happen, do you feel content or unsatisfied? That is the feeling of vexation. In broad terms. When you're waiting for something to happen, when you're waiting for someone to deliver something to you, when you're waiting for a knock on the door, when you're waiting for the phone call, that's vexation. As you see your child crossing the street and you see a vehicle approaching, or as you are on crossing the street and you see a vehicle coming from afar and you feel that a sense of fear, these are all products, extensions of vexation. Vexation is a state where the mind wants something and it's yearning for it and longing for it. That's that state. It's when you know tomorrow's Christmas and there are presents under the Christmas tree but you can't have them until the following morning. That's the state of vexation. Your mind goes into a, a sense of unfulfillment. It's like it's... There's a vacuum for something. It's waiting to be fulfilled. That is at state. It only happens when there's a wanting. It's when you know you've bought something from the shop. Say you bought a quiche and you, would like, you, like, you want to have it, but you have to wait until you get home to put it in the microwave. It's when you've ordered something online and they have to wait until they deliver it to you. You want it, but it's not there. Now you have a vexation. It's when someone gives you a present but it's wrapped up, you don't know what's in there, so you have to wait until you take the layers off and you have, for that you have to wait until they, they, until they leave. Otherwise it seems rude. So you want to know what's there, you want to find out, but you don't have the answer right now, so you're vexed. It's when you see two people whispering something in each other's ear and you're wondering what it might be that they're talking about. What might it be that they're talking about? Are they talking about you? Vexations. These are all manifestations and extensions of vexation. Now, have none of you experienced vexation? Is there anyone here who hasn't experienced vexation? Well, you all know the feeling. This is all because the mind wants something. It's when you are a prisoner and you want to get out of prison. That's vexation. Why do you think prison is a punishment? We have prisons, yeah? Why do you think prisons are a punishment? Because they don't want to be there. 
what do they want then? To be out, to be elsewhere. That's why it's a punishment. If they didn't want to be elsewhere, prison would no longer be a punishment. So, if you gave me the chance to go and speak to a bunch of prisoners, what do you think I'll talk to them about? A jataka tale? If you, if you gave me the chance to go and speak to a bunch of prisoners, what do you think I'm going to talk to them about? This. I'm going to explain to them that you only suffer because you want to be not here but somewhere else. I'm going to help them come out of the wanting to be somewhere else. So I'm going to free them from prison. That's freedom. Then it doesn't matter where you are. If you don't want to be here right now, you're in prison. You make your own prison. Prison is not the four walls around you. Then home is also a prison, isn't it? There also you have four walls. A prison is not a building. It's not, an, it's not a physical thing. A prison is a mental thing. You create your own prison. When you want the next iPhone, and you, want to, you have to queue in line for it, that's prison. Each chitta that arises and passes away, it's in a prison because it wants something but it can't have it. When you're waiting for that job interview, when you're waiting for that confirmation that you have got the job, right? But they said, well, we'll call you, we'll call you. Every time you ring them, you say, well, we'll call you. We'll call you and let you know. That's prison. Now tell me, if you love yourself, what must you do? Is it not to get yourself out of prison? Well, prison break is what we need. Break out of prison. You create your own prison. All because of wanting. And that wanting is only there. Ah, I didn't put attachment on here. Attachment. That's what happens first. When you believe there's beauty in an object, now you're attached to it. When there's attachment, there's wanting it. And when there's wanting for something, there's vexation. When there's vexation, now you need to do something about vexation. You need to do something to come out of vexation. That's when you start doing the things that you do. Take an example. Someone comes and says, uh, a friend calls you and says, hey, there's a new restaurant, a new Chinese place. Shall we go and try it? Right? So what are they saying really? What are they giving you right now? I'm on the phone. You are my friend. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. There's a new Chinese in town. The food I've heard is delectable. What am I giving you right now? This is called drushti. Views or drushti. I'm telling you, I'm indoctrinating you that beauty is in the object. So I'm taking the word beauty in a general sense. Yeah, because of course beauty is not in food, beauty is in, an, in a sight, but I'm using it in a general sense, okay? So when I say beauty, I don't just mean sights, I also mean sound, smell, taste, touch and so on. So when I speak to you on the phone and I say there's a new Chinese in town, the food I've heard is delicious, I'm giving you a view. If you take my view on board, if you accept what I have to say, now you have been officially indoctrinated. You have now been indoctrinated. Now, therefore, now you have an avidya. You are now ignorant. <coughs> ignorant how? Because now you think that the food is delicious. I've just given you this view that the food is delicious. So if you, hear, if you now believe my, my word, now you're going to be attached to it. You have not even stepped foot into the restaurant yet. But mentally you're attached to it now. You're at attached to the idea. You, you're attached to the potential for, for pleasure. So now what do you want to do? 
Once I've told you that and you accepted it, what do you want to do now? You want to go to the restaurant? Yeah, of course you want to go to, re go to the restaurant. So I ask you now, so uh, what do you say? Shall we try it this evening? Shall we try it this evening? Yes. Ah, okay. Why do you say yes? No, no, not to be polite to me, like I don't care what you say, but why are you actually saying yes? Because now you are attached to it. Why? Why are you attached to it? Because I have, I have indoctrinated you. I have told you that the food is delectable. You have accepted, you have believed my word. You haven't even tried the food yet. But you really want the food now because you have taken my word for it. Now you are attached to it. When you are attached to it, now you want it. Because you want it, now you are vexing for it. Your mind has gone into a void. A, a state of, it's like a vacuum, waiting, for, waiting to be filled. You know how the wind blows? When there's a state of low pressure and there's air around you, then the, the air blows in, flows in, that's what we call wind. With vexation, the same thing happens. It's like a state of low pressure in your mind. You want whatever it is you're attached to. So now, your mind has to go looking for, by opening its eyes, opening the ears, sticking the tongue out, taking in through the nose and the rest of the body, whatever it is that the mind is vexing for. That's why you open your eyes. Like I said, you know, gift yourself by looking around. If you think the flowers are beautiful, you will have to look. You can't help it. Now I've just told you that the food in the restaurant is wonderful, it's fantastic, you have to go try it, let's go this evening and you said yes. Why? Because in your mind, now you want it. You are now vexing for it. If you are vexing for it, you can't just do nothing about it, you have to do something for it. So what do you do? Now we start making plans. Shall I come and pick you up around uh, 7 o'clock? Yeah? Yeah, so there you go then. See, now we are making plans. Plans to do what? No, no, not to go to the restaurant. What are we making plans for? To relieve ourselves from vexation. That's what we are making plans for. I can stop all this with, another, with one more phone call. Here's another phone call. Oh, you know that appointment that we made uh, at 7 o'clock the restaurant? You know, I've just heard that uh, someone's been poisoned. And they'd done an investigation and they'd found a dead rat. Do you still want to go? What happened to that vexation? It's disappeared. Why did the vexation disappear? The wanting disappeared. Why did the wanting disappear? The attachment disappeared. Why did the attachment disappear? Your drushti disappeared. You see cause and effect? When there are causes, there's an effect. Seize the causes, the effect ceases. See, there was only one way I could, I could make you change your mind, and that is by replacing the drushti that I had given you earlier, that the food is good, it's a wonderful place, magic, fantastic. I've just replaced that drushti by saying, that place, it's potentially deadly. We had better not go there. That was a drushti. You've not even tried the food yet. You don't know. I'm just giving you drushti. See how dangerous a drushti is? It's mere words, isn't it? See, a few words can get you up on your feet and a few more words can put yourself back down on your seat. Simple as. I said, let's go to the restaurant. The food is nice. Now you're back up by getting yourself dressed and preparing yourself to go. You're finding, your, you're looking for your nicest kit and so on. But I've, then I give you another call and say, no, food is not good, it's, it's bad, it's dangerous, it's terrible. You back down. You see, this is the mind that's doing all this to you. You're walking up around, you know, going around and about, that's all because the mind wants that. You open your eyes, you look around, it's all because your mind wants it. Why do you go sightseeing? Tell me. Why do you go sightseeing? Because someone's given you a drushti. So there may be some among you who like bird watching. Why? Someone's given you a drushti. That birds are, you know, they're colorful, they're wonderful creatures, you know, bird nature. You've got to go see it, you've got to watch it. It's beautiful, fantastic. So you take that drushti. Then in the, 
And then once you get that dushti, you're now you're attached. Once you're attached, you want. Once you want, you're vexed. And now once you're vexed, you have to do something to relieve yourself of vexation. Relief. You have to do something to relieve yourself of vexation. This is like when a pressure cooker, the nozzle at the top, and what happens when the pressure cooker builds up the pressure inside? It releases. The same thing happens when you are finally given the object that you desired. When presented with the object about which I had indoctrinated you, this pressure is relieved. That is what you experience as pleasure. It's not something the object gave you. Let me say that again. I gave you an indoctrination at the beginning. Right? I indoctrinated you. I said the food was fantastic. Then you attached. This is all happening in the mind. Once you're attached, now you're vexing. When you're vexing, sorry, I beg your pardon, you want it. When you want something, you're vexing. When you're vexing for it, now you're looking for relief. The only way I can relieve you now, actually there are two ways. I've shown you one on the board. The, this, is the, this is the simplest way that people choose to relieve themselves and that is by presenting the object that the mind was initially indoctrinated about, now the mind can be relieved because the mind thinks that beauty is in the object. Because the mind thinks that beauty is in the object, now given the object that the mind was looking forward to, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching and so on, the mind experiences relief. That relief is experienced as pleasure. It is felt as pleasure. It's felt as pleasure. I've given you the finger experiment before, remember? I've said, bend your finger backwards and it hurts. Right? Keep bending it as far back as you can and it hurts a lot more. At some point, when you let go of it, you experience relief. That's pleasure. That pleasure came from where? Did it come from the other hand? Was it in the finger somewhere? No, it only came, you only experienced it because you were relieved from pain, that's all. So relief from pain is what you experience as pleasure, therefore no pain, no, no gain, there you go. That's why, that's why it's no pain, no gain. There has to be pain beforehand. So therefore in any moment in life, in any instance in life where you experience pleasure, tell me something else that's also, that was also there a moment ago. Anytime you experience pleasure, tell me one other thing that was also there a moment ago. Pain. Aren't you happy when you get your exam results and you have passed well? If you've done well, don't, doesn't that make you happy? Why? Why does that make you happy? Because what were you a moment ago? Vexed. When you get on a knee and you ask her, will you marry me? And then she's like, hmm, got to think about it. Hmm, uh, how are you feeling at that time? Don't say no, my friends are around, everyone's watching right now, this is embarrassing. And then she finally says, yes. How does that make you feel? Hmm? On cloud nine, right? Yes. When you're waiting for someone and they turn up, when you're waiting for that phone call, see, take every example of pleasure you have experienced in your life, ladies and gentlemen, and you will be living proof that wherever you have experienced pleasure, there has always been pain a moment ago. I have to get you to ask this question of yourself, is it worth it? If you really love yourself, would you put yourself through that? There, is, there are no lay pleasures, okay? That's the pleasure that you experience. There are no lay pleasures which are genuine pleasures. They're all fake. Each and every one of them, absolute and utter fakes. You were fooled and you fell for it. In the sasana, there are actual pleasures. But we don't call them pleasures, we call them ultimate happiness. 
Because that happiness is not dependent on anything. Your happiness is dependent on things. If you ask someone out and they say, yes, now you're happy. If they say, no, you're unhappy. You try and cook something at home and, and you, know, you try to bake, bake a cake. If it comes out good, you're happy. If it burns, you're unhappy. See, your happiness is always dependent. Meaning, you're always vexing about something and then you have to be relieved from that vexation to be happy. That cannot be true happiness. Do you want to put yourself through this? I mean, if you, want, if you went through this because you never looked at life this way before, fair enough, because you had no alternative. But now, I mean, I'm laying it bare for you. you know, do yourself a favor and try and comprehend what I'm trying to sh share with you folks, please. Do yourself a favor. Whenever you experience pleasure, there's always pain beforehand, isn't there? When you're driving along the streets, right, someone crosses in front of you. You feel an intense sense of fear. But the moment that you know that there was a narrow escape, now you, you, breathe, you breathe a sigh of relief. So what came first? The pain came first. And then after that, pleasure. Now if you needed that pleasure again, what must you do? If you want that pleasure again, what must you do? Hmm? Drive on a busy street. So don't give that task to a driver. You do it. So if you want to enjoy the pleasures of driving around the streets of Colombo, right, get yourself out on a busy Monday morning. Right, and then drive around and then just go through narrow escapes all the time. And don't, don't take the old car, take the new car. It works better that way, honestly. Works better. Why? Because you are more vexed about the new car. See, I'm giving you ways in which to, play, to please yourselves. Don't I, don't I really care about you? I love you. So I'm sharing with you ways in which you can be happy in your lay lives because you don't want to consider coming to the holy life, right? Here's another way you can do it, right? As you're walking down the road, you see it's, it's, it's a busy, busy street, right? Vehicles going up and down, and right? you have your little one in your hand, and you say, Puta, let go, let go of his hand, and then ask him to just cross the street. And then you see a truck approaching from that side, there's another vehicle coming from this side, and you see your child, and then your heart's going to skip a beat. In that moment, like Superman does, right? Fly in, save your child, and then bring them back to, say, to, to where it's safe. And then you will feel a sigh of relief. That's pleasure for you. If you want that again, do it again. Isn't, isn't life thrilling? When you find something lost, you've lost, don't you make, doesn't it make you feel happy? You lose something and you find it. Doesn't it make you feel happy? Why? Come on, why? Because what did losing it make you feel? Sad, vexed. Right? So therefore, finding it relieves you from that vexation and you feel happy. Let's say you lost this. Okay, you lose this and it's precious to you. And then you find it and now you are relieved of vexation. After you are relieved of vexation, now you keep this in your hand like this the rest of the day. Does that make you happy the same way? Does it? Answer, does it? No. Then can you tell me that it is the object that gave you happiness? If it were the object that gave you happiness, then after you have found it, it should continue pleasing you, shouldn't it? But does it? No. To be happy again, you have to lose this again. And then find it again. So the best way to be happy then is Come on. Yes. Bingo. Inflict pain first and then relieve yourself from it. 
If that was my doctrine, don't you think I'm crazy? If that is what I had to teach you? Right? Whenever you want pleasure, go, go, go suffer first and then relieve yourself from that and then enjoy life. If that was my philosophy, would you, would you come to the sermons another day? No, but that's your philosophy. You should thank me for coming to spend time with you. <laughs> when are you going to break free from this trap? It's a vicious circle. I have some homework for you before we end for today. Over the course of the next week, five instances if possible, write it down. Because then you will actually be doing this. Right? So you can be accountable to yourself. Write down five instances where you experience pleasure. And then you can't stop there. You have to ask yourself, how did this bring me pleasure? Dig. Keep on digging. And then you will discover that there was pain beforehand. If you can do this at least five times, you'll begin to understand that what I have shared with you today is true. Then you will begin to ask yourself, is it worth it? If pleasure was never out there and all there was was simply pain, because you caused that pain yourself, and then you relieved yourself from pain by doing various things, this is what we call Abhisankar, the actions, the words, the thoughts and the speech that you have to conduct. Kaya Abhisankar, Vachi Abhisankar and Manu Abhisankar. Ignore the body words, it doesn't matter. But these are the actions that we take to relieve ourselves from vexation. Once you relieve yourself from vexation, now you experience a sense of pleasure. If you think that it's the object that you have acquired that brought you that pleasure, what a fool you are. I have proved it to you. You lose something, you, you find it again, keep it in your hand for the rest of the day and ask yourself whether it makes you happier. It doesn't. See? Do five of this as homework. On whose behalf? On my behalf? No. On your behalf. Just five instances. If you can, write them down, otherwise make a mental note at the very least. And if you come here with some member of your family, on each, in each of those instances, share it with the other person. So you can have an accountability partner. And do a favor for the other person that comes with you to the sermons, ask them. Ask the other person, what, have you found your five yet? Right? Have you done one yet? Have you done two yet? Three yet? I, that, that would be a great conversation to have because you're discussing the Dhamma. The Dhamma that sets you free. Like I said, if you can't let go of the attachment to these objects, folks, you will come back for them. I want you to free yourselves. Don't suffer. Suffering is a choice. Just as much as happiness is a choice. You always choose to suffer. I'm showing you that there's an alternative. So stop choosing suffering and you will stop suffering. That's it. The quest of our lives, the purpose of our lives is achieving this salvation for ourselves and for others. Who we cross paths with. You and I, we have cross paths. So therefore today, the only thing I have to offer you is this. If you and I had cross paths when I was a lay person, I might have given you a job. I might have lent you some money. I might have been a good friend to you. Maybe lent a year. Maybe invited you for a meal, had dinner, maybe gone out to a party or maybe gone out to the movies. That's what we would have done. None of those things would have done any good to you. So gladly you and I didn't meet when I was a lay person. No good would have come to you, honestly. Because I would have said, <laughs> there's a nice Chinese, shall we go out? <laughs> no good would have come to you in meeting me when I was a lay person, honestly. At least when I didn't have the Dhamma. A few years after I got the Dhamma, I, I decided it was time. I think I was, I had listened to the sermons for about two years, three years, something like that. Then I started preaching, even as a lay person. 
And then soon enough I realized, what's the point? If beauty is not in these objects, why do I surround myself with these useless things? Useless. Some are alive, some are dead. Some are, you know, what's the point? Some have life, some don't have life. Same thing. So I want you to come to the same realization because you and I, we are not different. You suffer, you suffer. I suffer, I suffer. We all suffer because of attachment. That's it. So today it has become our quest, our purpose in life to share this with as many people as we possibly can as we take it on for ourselves as well. And today I want to show you an example of that before I conclude. So recently we had a bunch of students who came over from an international school. So they've been working quite closely with us because the, the, the teachers, the, the principals and the management of the school, they're very keen on the Dhamma. They listen to the sermons regularly. They come to the monastery and they, because they have realized that this is the path for their salvation. And it's fantastic when teachers and senior management of any organization begin to understand the Dhamma because you know, their subordinates, their students, their colleagues, their employees, they have a duty to at least listen to what the seniors have to say. Right? So that's a fantastic arrangement. So what we tend to do is when, when we have that opportunity, we share the Dhamma with, with senior management and so on. And then once, if they, if they understand that this is the truth, then they make it their life's effort to try and share this with as many people as they possibly can. And this happens quite a lot. So some children from an international school, they came to our monastery recently and we, there was a program that we designed for them. In fact, the staff, they've been working with us for a long time now and we also do a Sunday school for them. So our Swami Nuhan says, they visit the school and they do a Sunday school for them. So when I leave to come to Rajagiriya, a group of our monks, they go to the school and they do the Sunday school program there. And then they, they, they serve the children by giving them the Dhamma. So this is an inspiration for you. I know for a fact that among you are those who, can, who are influencers. There are those among you who can influence the choices that other people make. Because people regard you with respect. They, they regard you highly. Perhaps you are senior, senior officials of your organization. Perhaps you are teachers. Perhaps you are, you, are, you are principals. Perhaps you are the head of an organization. If you understand that this is the truth, not otherwise, don't give someone that something you don't want for yourself. It makes no sense to do that. If you understand that this is the truth, and if this has given you a path to happiness, then have mercy on those who come to you looking for answers to life. Have mercy on them. If you are a teacher and you believe that this is the path to happiness, your students are at your mercy. They have come to you not only to learn science and maths, they have come to learn science and maths from you because they believe learning science and math will help them to be happy in life. Actually, that's what they have come to you for, to learn how to be happy. Your workers who work for you, your employees, they come to work for you because they believe that you have something to give them that makes them happy and they think that's money. They think that's opportunities. They think that's status. They think that's a company car. But you have something more than that to offer them. Something that money cannot buy. If you believe that the Dhamma is true and if you are being healed by the Dhamma, then I invite you May this video inspire you. Share the truth of the world. Share the Buddha's teachings with as many people as you possibly can, ladies and gentlemen. Try, if you can, in this new year to introduce the Dhamma to five more people. To five individuals, poor souls just like you were before you got the Dhamma. They are just as entitled to the Buddha's teachings, aren't they? If it's a mind that suffers, that mind is entitled to the Dhamma. Simple as that. Among them may be your friends, maybe your colleagues, maybe your parents, maybe your aunt, maybe your uncle, maybe your cousins of yours, maybe your classmates, 
Maybe you are the president of an old boys association at school. Maybe you are an office bearer of some sort in your school, in your workplace. Maybe you are a leader in your community. Just give them the Dhamma, nothing more. And remind them, they can come here, bring in no gifts. We don't know, you don't need any gifts. Just ask them to come along, take the Dhamma. If they, if they, if they struggle to learn the Dhamma in English, well, you know, we're at the monastery, we have plenty of sermons that go on every day, almost. But if this is the truth to life, then give it to them, because they, they are at your mercy. All right, so let's watch the video and see what the children were able to gain from coming into the monastery and see how the Mahasangha were able to help them and support them. These children, you know, that one day that they spent at the monastery might have made an impact in their lives. Maybe a little bit, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a lot. We don't know. But what we do know is at least they have given their first sadhukar to the Buddha Sasa. That much we know. They were able to offer some dhani to the Swami Nuances. And these are not just any old Swami Nuances. I can say this because I am one of them. We practice the Dhamma like our life depends on it. That is what we came into the Sasana for, for nothing more than that. Nothing less than that, nothing more than that. We had plenty in our lay lives, ladies and gentlemen, and then we realized that we had nothing at all, actually. So we have not come into the Sasana for anything else other than Nibbana. And therefore, whatever offering the children make, whether it is serving some rice, offering a pirikara, the rewards of that are tremendous, infinite in reward. So I want you to watch this and hopefully it will inspire you. Start thinking about what you can do to be a mission, to be a part of the, the mission of the Buddha Sasana.
in Ranarama Monastery. We got the opportunity to perform uh, many virtuous uh, activities in this uh, temple or the monastery. Uh, we gave arms, we offered uh, Pirikara. Pirikara. We offered Pirikara and we did many, many uh, meritorious activities. So we are thankful for the Sangha, the Anagarika the, and the Anagarikas, the RI staff and our loving teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Mama Dini Ingiri Jetavanarama Arame. Eti Mama Satrugana Mukadde Dina Maharita Mahagata. Eva Gema may Parisare take a non good at Kanish to Sambanduna. Eva Gema Mama Pansele Patil to the Goda Kupagarka. Eva Gem Mans Tutigana Maguru Saha Sama Pansaleta Mata Meva at the Gema Laba Dina. Today we have arrived at the Jetavana Rame in Ingiria. So today we have we were able to do a lot of activities. So from the morning first we were able to listen to a Dhamma sermon preached by the Mahasangha Thero. And from that we were able to understand the different problems that we could uh, solve in our life and how we could find the path to happiness. And also, uh, you know, we were able to participate in a lot of Buddhist activities such as offering lamps, incense sticks and we were able to hold the Mutukuda for the Mahasangha Thero. And also uh, from this, we can be able to see the, the most beautiful place, one of the beautiful places in here. And it shows how nature is connected to these Buddhist places too. And this gave us an opportunity to escape from the uh, isolated environments and be able to be connected to the environment and help us to get a spiritual guidance. So I hope other children of my age too would come and see this place. Thank you and may the people gem bless you. That might have been the first time for some children to actually go into a monastery, some of those children, and offer arms. A day in paradise. In fact, those uh, the video clips where they gave their comments, they had recorded them, with, we didn't even know about it, and they sent it to us. So when we made the video, we just added that to the end of it. So it was not on our request that they gave those comments. It was all their own doing. So they've shared how they genuinely felt about coming to the monastery and taking part in that. So, you know, among them may be your children, maybe your brothers, maybe your sisters. If they aren't, then they should be, is what I'm saying. And what if every child could have such an opportunity, at least once in their lives, at least once. But today we are growing up in a world where uh, people's focus are not in these things. It's about education, it's about you know, reaching the top, the pinnacle of the world in a, through their careers and professions and so on. But people have forgotten why they were born human in the first place. None of these things would matter if, you're not, if you can't die a happy man, isn't it? So I want this to be an inspiration for all of you. And also, I want you all to rejoice in the merits that they were all able to do because all of this is possible thanks to everyone. Like I always say, this is not just us as monks who make all of the work that we do at the monastery possible. I, I told you earlier we have 160 children at the monastery. That might almost sound like me boasting. I am boasting, but I am boasting about what we've all been able to do together. I couldn't do that all by myself. I mean, what do I have to my name today? Nothing. It may be the pirikara that you offer that today becomes a cup of milk, a glass of milk to the child. You can provide the requisites, we provide the dhamma. Together, we can create a magnificent human being. That is the relationship that we have with the lay community. Besides that, of course, but more and far more importantly, the lay community must take the Dhamma from us so that they can also get on this journey from being lay to coming to the sasana. Remember I told you the story of the Vatapata the other day? Hmm? You start out here as lay people, colorful, but then you eventually join the community and then wherever you are, you converge on one point. And that one point is Nibbana. That is a story that the Vatabhata tells you every day. 
as you see it. On the outside it's all colorful. That's the variety that we come with. As lay people we are very various. We have different colors, different things, lots of things make us happy. But once you begin to understand the Dhamma, you all start to converge on one point. That is the shared purpose that we have and that is Nibbana. So for as long as we are alive, all of us, let us try and do this for ourselves and for as many other people as we possibly can. The only purpose of existence is to try and find ultimate happiness, that's all. I forgot to mention, ladies and gentlemen, two of our monks are back in Australia now for a three-month, what shall we call it, a Dhamma tour, yes, thank you. The word that came to mind was pilgrimage, but that's not what they're on, a Dhamma tour. So they're on a three-month Dhamma tour in Australia. They'll be traveling around the country, spreading the gifts of Dhamma and helping their mothers and fathers in Australia, their brothers and sisters in Australia, to achieve the same liberation and freedom as you do. So if they have friends there, if you have family there, people who are known to you, who might benefit from that, then you can inform them about this. We will include a link to their itinerary in the uh, description on the... I was pointing like this, <laughs> out of habit. It will be in the YouTube video description. So if there's anyone you know who might benefit from those programs, then please pass the news on so that they can find the information that they need and then take part in those programs. They'll be doing retreat programs, they'll be doing meditation programs, sermons and all sorts. So Buddha Puja and the lot, right? So you can let them know and then give others an opportunity to take part in them as well. They do the whole tour. So Sydney, Melbourne, uh, so they, they travel the whole country. So we're not, we're not, uh, we're not, they don't stay put in one place. So there's not really like, we don't have a monastery there. What we do is people who organize this, they book venues in different parts of the country and they're, most of the time they're in flights traveling from one part to the other. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be, uh, in the itinerary you can find the dates as to when they'll be in various parts of the country. That program will we'll include in the YouTube description of the video. We'll also share it in the group. I think there's a WhatsApp group, don't we? You're all members of a WhatsApp group, so we'll include the link there so you can pick it up from there as well. Right, let's conclude for today. We'll transfer the merits and bring we'll today's sermon to a close. First and foremost, then, let us take a moment to transfer all the merits that we have acquired. By making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem, listening to the Dhamma, inviting the Mahasangha to deliver the sermons, as well as creating a conducive environment for all to come along and practice the path and achieve their salvation. Let us remind ourselves that today we are able to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma thanks to the efforts made by the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas from, since, from time immemorial as they have protected and preserved the Tripitaka, which has been passed down to us through the generations of the noble lineage. Let us take a moment to transfer this merits to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer this merits to the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us also transfer this merits to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transferring this talk, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this merits to our devotees and friends of the monastery who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana continue to sustain the Mahasangha. 
This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who pass on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to our friends and families, our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employers and our employees, our teachers, those of gone the extra mile on our behalf, those who have helped us, supported us and assisted us in any way, shape or form, may they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits, may they also be freed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles through their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and may they also attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to fulfill the Sambuddha Sasana and preserve the Sambuddha Sasana. Let us also transfer this message to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to those who passed away in our name, our loved ones, our forefathers, our ancestors, reminding ourselves that it is in their blood, sweat and tears today we are able to practice the path in peace and harmony. May they all rejoice in this marriage. Let us also transfer this message to the members of the armed forces who sacrifice their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer merits to those who lost their lives in the wars, be they friend or foe, as well as those who lost their lives to natural disasters and calamities, such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods, pandemics, and so on, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, friends and acquaintances to us, people who have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form possible and available to them out of gratitude and an immense sense of compassion and loving kindness to all of them. Let us transfer these merits to them. May, by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May, the, may these merits help them to abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power and blessings of all the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And may you and I and everyone who has helped make this program a success become a Rahatan Vahanse or an Arahateran in Vahanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. Rag ginnen midetnva, desh ginnen midetnva, moh ginnen midetnva, nibbana param sukhayen. Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Mamada Sialu Loka Sialu Satnvayo Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Raga Gini Niveva Dvesha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva Nivan Sapa Labeva Nivan Sapa Labeva 
निवान सपलेवा